Hi, Christ Community Chapel. Pastor Zach here. Listen, I know it's not preferable to be watching the sermon online. Uh, We all wish we could be together. I hope you're looking forward to when we can be back together as a church. I know I am. But I'm also thankful for the technology that we have, that we can still bring God's word to you digitally. And so I hope you're ready to dial in with me and spend a little time thinking about God's word. To do that, we're going to continue our sermon series on the Ten Commandments. We're looking at the Ten Commandments not just by themselves, but in light of what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? And he answers that the greatest command is to love God with all that you are. And then he follows that with the second greatest command, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. But it's what he says next that's so interesting. After saying that the greatest command is to love God and the second is to love your neighbor, he says basically all of the law in the Bible, all the rules, all the commands boil down to these two things. It's almost as though Jesus is inviting us to take a command from the Bible and to sit and think about how that might connect to loving God and loving your neighbor. It's almost as though what Jesus is saying is there are really only two rules in the Bible, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So what we're doing is taking Jesus up on that challenge, and we're doing that by looking at the 10 most famous rules in all of the Bible, the 10 commandments. And by looking at them, we're saying not just what does this commandment say and what does that mean for our lives, but we're also asking how does this connect to love? How does this connect to loving God and loving our neighbor? We're looking at them almost, if you will, again for the first time. And this week, we're looking at the ninth commandment, which says this. You could find it in Exodus chapter 20 in verse 16. And it says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, what does that mean? Well, in the original audience, what they would have heard is you should not lie in court. I mean, back then, justice was primarily dependent on eyewitness testimony. There were no forensics. There was no CSI journey to the promised land. And so because of that, they had to depend on what you saw. So if someone lied in court, if someone said, I saw them do that, or I saw them go about that, there was really no way to overcome that. You were going to be convicted. And so this commandment had in mind, hey, when you go to court, when you testify, don't lie. But for us, it's not only applicable to the justice system, but to lying in general. That the sentiment here is you should not lie. That God has in mind honesty and integrity, not just in the legal system, but in general. God is telling us he does not want us to lie. And I want to explore that with you a little bit here today, and I want to use a three-point outline to do that. So you can write these down or just kind of have them in your mind to make sense of this commandment. And here's the outline. Number one, I want to talk about why we lie. Number two, why lying is wrong. And number three, how we can stop. Okay, Why we lie, why lying is wrong, and how we can stop. First, let's talk about why we lie. Dan Ariely is a behavior economist at Duke. He, he wrote a fascinating book called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. And in that book, uh, Dan Ariely explores why we lie. Why do we lie? He talks about how most of us think we lie because we do some kind of rational calculus in our mind. We, we do the math and just think that lying gives us a strategic advantage. But he says that's not actually true. Instead, he boils down the reasons why we lie into two. The first reason, he says, is because we want to be seen as honorable. The second reason we lie is because we want to get stuff. Now, those are kind of wonky expressions. So let me put it this way. Let me say the same thing in a different way. What Ariely tells us is that the reason why we lie is because we want to be loved and we want to be taken care of. Let's talk about those for a second. Ariely says we want to be seen as honorable. I'm recasting that as we want to be loved. It's the same thing. What he means and what I mean is that one of the reasons we lie is because we want people to like us. 
We want people to respect us, to see us as lovable, to see us as honorable. And deep down, what we believe is that if we said what we really think or how we really feel, if we let people in to who we really were, they wouldn't love us, they wouldn't respect us, and they wouldn't honor us. So we lie because we believe the fictitious version of ourselves is actually going to be more lovable than the real version of ourselves. I'll I'll tell you a quick story that proves this point from my own life. Uh, In the fourth grade, my teacher was Mrs. Gaskins. And I don't remember much about her or the fourth grade except for this one little thing. Uh, I was in love with her. So I thought she was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. I have no idea if that's true. I was just in the fourth grade, and I wanted to take every opportunity I could to impress Mrs. Gaskins, including one day in class when we were studying astronomy, and she asked the class if anyone had a telescope. Now, none of the students raised their hands. None of us had a telescope, and Mrs. Gaskins was super disappointed. She was hoping someone would bring the telescope in and we could do some exploring as a class. And I didn't want to see her that way, and I saw this as my big moment, so I shot my hand up and said, Mrs. Gaskins, I have a telescope. She got really excited and said, you do? What is it like? And I described what could basically only be described as the Hubble telescope. I mean, I was big, you could see everything. I think it was red, it was great. She got excited, the class got excited, and for a moment, I was the hero of that fourth grade class. I was loved, except there was a problem. I I didn't have a telescope. And uh, I never really thought about what would happen if she found that out, but when My dad showed up that day to pick me up. Mrs. Gaskins went up to him and said, hey, uh, thank you so much for letting Zach bring in his telescope, to which my dad eloquently said, what telescope? And the jig was up. Why did I lie? Well, I wanted to be loved. I wanted Mrs. Gaskins to see me as the prize student. I wanted to be respected. I, I, I wanted to be admired. And I believed that in that moment, being honest about not having a telescope was going to cost me that. So I lied and said I had one. And, and I was looking for that sense of affirmation. Listen, have you ever lied for that reason? Have you ever told something that wasn't true because you believe that it would make someone like you more, respect you more, honor you more, love you more? Ariely says that's a big reason why we lie. We want to be loved, and we're not sure that it's really possible to be known and loved. We create a false version of ourselves. But the second reason why we lie is that we want to be taken care of, or as Ariely would say, we want to get stuff. And we just believe that if we told the truth, it would cost us. If we told the truth, we wouldn't get promoted. We would owe a little more. We'd pay a little more in taxes, whatever it might be. And so we cut a corner. We cheat the system. We tell a lie because we believe that if we do that, we will be taken care of. And we do this because, hey, it's a dog-eat-dog world out there. You have to look out for yourself. You have to look out for your family. You have to take care of yourself. And Ariely says this crippling sense of pressure, this idea that we have to look out for ourselves, in the end, costs us our integrity. And I want you to think about this for a second. Here's what I believe. It is almost impossible to follow a rule that you don't understand. That's why toddlers, by the way, are always asking you why. You tell them, don't touch this, and they say, why? Don't go there. Why? Because what they're saying is, it's hard to obey you if I don't get it. Listen, the truth is that we don't break this commandment to lie because we just like to break rules. We break it because we don't get it. We break it because deep down we are struggling with a crippling sense of loneliness on a belief that we cannot really be loved. And we're struggling with this intense pressure to provide for ourselves and for our families. And so we live our lives every minute of the day saying, I must look out for me. And if people knew the real me, they wouldn't love me. And so we lie. And here's the truth. We can never fully reckon with our lying, with our lack of integrity, until we're honest about where it's coming from. And Ariely and I think the scriptures are telling us where it's coming from is a deep sense of loneliness and a deep pressure to take care of ourselves. That's why we lie. 
But if that's true, then that leads me to my second point, which is to ask, why is it wrong? So then that brings up this question. If we lie because we have this deep-rooted sense of loneliness, we want to be loved and we don't think we can be loved if we're fully known. And if we lie because we have this crippling pressure to take care of ourselves and to feed our families and to make sure there's money in the bank, then why is it wrong? I mean, is it wrong to want to be loved? Is it, is it wrong to want to take care of yourself and those you care about? It doesn't feel wrong. And that is, by the way, why how we justify lying. Because we just think we have to do it to live in this world and to be loved, to live in this world and to be taken care of. You, you, you have to lie. We don't say that out loud. We wouldn't say that in our small groups or our ABF classes. But that's really what we think. To get ahead in this world relationally, occupationally, financially, you got to lie. You got to cheat the system. So how is it that God would say to us, don't lie? Is he that out of touch with our reality? Why is lying wrong. Well, I want to give you three reasons why lying is wrong. And and these reasons build. In other words, reason three is the most important reason. But here they are. Uh, Number one, I want to give you a practical reason. Number two, a relational reason. And number three, a spiritual reason. Let's talk about the practical reason. First, you should know that in his book, Dan Ariely argues that for most of us, lying, it doesn't work. It doesn't actually do what we think it's going to do. And he says the reasons for that are obvious. For example, if you lie in order to be loved, if you say, if they knew the real me, they wouldn't love me, and you create a fictitious version of yourself to be loved, even if you get affection from that person, you're not really getting affection, right? It's the false version of yourself. You've created a fictitious version and they love that version. And so you might get some of the outward accompaniments of love. They may date you. They they may marry you. They may say nice things about you. They may give you the job. But in the end, you'll always wrestle with this deep sense of loneliness because you'll know they don't love me. They love a false version of me. So lying in the end kind of gets us some rewards of love, but it never really gives us love. And I, I'm sorry to say, I think a lot of us know this. We we feel this way. We, we live this way. You might be in a marriage right now, in a relationship right now of some sort where you know you feel incredibly lonely because you don't really feel known. But if we lie, we cost ourselves that, right? They, they haven't robbed us of that. We've robbed ourselves by by not giving them the chance to know the real us. Of course, when we lie to get stuff, that doesn't work either because if you lie to get occupation, if you lie to increase your bank account, then you live with this perpetual fear that you're going to have to somehow keep it safe. You have its ill-gotten gains. You, you, you've you got to continue to manipulate, continue to cheat, continue to cut corners in order to stay where you are. Friends, if that's where you are, I, I want to invite you into this idea that lying makes a lot of sense to us on the front end, but on the back end, it never delivers. I want to invite you into the idea that the reason why right now you feel incredibly lonely and the reason why right now you feel incredibly afraid is because you have lied your way to where you are. You've broken this commandment and it's showing. Here's the second reason lying is wrong and let's call it the relational reason. It's interesting how much grace we extend to ourselves when it comes to lying. It's so easy to justify. Well, sure, I lied, but if I had told the truth, I would have hurt their feelings. Or sure, I lied, but if I told the truth, they, they, she wouldn't have gone out with me. Or they wouldn't have given me the job. Or I would have owed more money that I don't have. It's always easy to justify our own lies. But let me ask you this. How much grace do you extend to those who lie to you? Uh, That's where the rubber meets the road, right? It's really hard to extend grace when we're lied to. In fact, when someone lies to us, we are outraged. Our sense of justice flares up. We'll say things like, I can't believe you lied to me. I'll, I'll never trust you again. How could you do this? We feel betrayed. We feel hurt. We feel angry. But that's what lying does. And just as that's how we feel, listen, all the lies that you and I have told, 
if the people we've lied to were ever to discover those lies. That is how they would feel. Lying hurts people. It doesn't work, and it hurts people. But here's the third reason lying is wrong. And I told you, they crescendo. This is the biggest reason. And that is that lying is fundamentally saying some awful things about God. Remember that I told you that Ariely says there are two reasons why we lie. Number one, we want to be loved, and we don't think we can really be loved if we tell the truth. And number two, we want to get stuff. We want to take care of ourselves. Well, at its core, what we're really saying then is that we need love. We, we lack love, and we have to take care of ourselves because if we don't, no one else will. Well, you must understand then that what we're really saying is that God you don't really love me, and God, you won't really take care of me. I have to get my own love. I have to take care of myself. Therefore, I lie. It's just another way of saying God can't be trusted. It might interest you to know that this is actually a big part of the biblical story. In fact, in the book of Genesis, in the first two chapters, God makes Adam and Eve and he rests them in the Garden of Eden, this paradise he's created for them. And he gives them only one rule, just one. He tells them there's a certain tree in the middle of the garden that they shouldn't eat from. And he even tells them why. He tells them, don't eat from this tree or you're going to die. And they know God made the tree and made them and made the whole world. They know he knows what he's talking about. I mean, how hard would that be? One tree, you don't eat from it. Why? Well, because you'll die. That feels like an easy rule to keep. And it was for them. In fact, we don't know how long they lived in the Garden of Eden, walking by the tree, climbing the tree, sitting under the tree, never being tempted to eat from the tree until in Genesis 3, a serpent shows up. And the serpent shows up with a lie. That's right. It's a lie that actually leads the world into chaos. But I want you to hear the serpent's lie, and I want you to notice that what Dan Ariely wrote about thousands of years later is exactly what the serpent is telling Eve. Here's what he says. You can find this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. Here's what it says. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you see what this serpent says? He says, oh, Eve, God has lied to you. God told you you would die if you ate from that tree. Here's the truth. God doesn't really love you, Eve. He doesn't want you to be what you could be. He's not looking out for you. He's actually trying to oppress you or enslave you or imprison you. He doesn't want you to become what you could become. You could become like him. You don't need him, God has trapped you in the garden, not placed you in the garden. At the core of the snake's lies are these two ideas. Eve, you are not loved. And Eve, you are not taken care of. And the Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve believed those things, when they began to believe that they were not loved and they were not taken care of, that is when they ate from the tree. And that is when they plunged the world into sin and chaos and death. But let me tell you something. That same lie is echoing in all of our hearts. Lying is wrong because it is us believing what the snake said. God does not love me, therefore I'm not lovable, therefore I must lie to get love. The real me cannot be loved. God doesn't even love me. And then second saying, I have to look out for myself. God won't take care of me. God won't provide for me. I have to provide for myself. Listen, friends, we lie because we believe that what the serpent said is true and therefore our lying is fundamentally not wrong because it doesn't work and not wrong because it hurts people. Though those things are true, it is fundamentally wrong because every time we lie, we are saying God cannot be trusted. He is not loving and he will not take care of us. Lying is an assault on the very character of God. And that's why God tells Israel here in Exodus 20, listen, don't bear false witness. Don't lie. You won't have to is what he's saying. 
But lying is wrong because every time we do it, we're looking at God and saying, yes, I do have to. You don't love me. You don't take care of me. I have to get those things for myself. And if that's true, then certainly that informs our third question. How then can we stop? Well, you can see right away that just telling us to not lie is not going to do it. Even telling ourselves, don't lie, don't lie, don't lie, don't lie, isn't going to do it. You can't put a rubber band on your wrist and pop it every time you lie. You can't get an accountability partner who calls you or emails you and says, did you lie today? Have you lied today? Are you going to lie tomorrow? Those things are not ultimately going to solve it for us because we don't lie simply out of convenience. We lie because of a deep-rooted belief that God doesn't love us and God doesn't actually take care of us. In order for us to become truth tellers, in order for us to become people of integrity, what's gonna have to change is at the heart level. We're gonna have to change these deep-rooted beliefs. We're gonna have to become convinced that God does love us, the real us, not the fake version of us. And by realizing that, we're gonna have to realize that the real version of us is lovable. And we're gonna have to become convinced that God will take care of us. And when that happens, we'll be freed from the need to take care of ourselves that causes us to cut corners. Well, so where do we go for that? How in the world could we ever become convinced that God loves the real us and that God takes care of us? Well, friends, for that, we have to turn to Jesus. And here's what we find, first of all, in the life of Jesus. Jesus was a man of impeccable integrity. He was a truth teller all the time. And by the way, that wasn't because he never found himself in a situation where he could have been a little more loved if he lied, or he could have been a little safer or a little more taken care of if he lied. No, his story is a story full of opportunities to cut corners, to take advantage, to cheat the system, but he never does. In fact, as you read the Gospels, the life of Jesus, you'll see all these times where he says the most sensationally true things. And you just think, oh my goodness, I can't believe you said that. Or you're leaning in as a reader saying, what's going to happen to him for saying that? He has no fear, no insecurity. Of course, why would he, right? When he was baptized, the heavens opened and God said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. That's a fancy way of saying, I love this guy, right? Jesus knew God loved him. Jesus knew God took care of him. Even when he fasted for 40 days and Satan showed up, the serpent, with another lie. And he said, hey, I'll feed you. Jesus said, hey, I don't worry about that. Man doesn't live by bread alone. Even when Pilate says to Jesus, don't you understand? It's my decision for you to live or for you to die. Jesus looks at him and says, you only have the power God has given you, which is a fancy way of saying God takes care of me. You see, friends, it's not as simple as saying that Jesus didn't lie because he was perfect. No, Jesus didn't lie because he knew he was loved and he knew he was taken care of. That's why he didn't lie. He was fully at peace with God. In fact, he was so at peace with God, he would say things like, whatever the Father does, I do. Whatever the Father says, I say, I and the Father are one. He would even call himself in John 14, the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who among us could give ourselves that nickname? I am the truth truth. We are not, but he was. The life of Jesus shows us both the beauty of integrity and the absence of integrity in our world and in us. But what's interesting is that Jesus's life of integrity doesn't lead him to fame or acclaim or peace. It leads him to the cross. And what I want you to notice is that on the cross, The Jesus on the cross does not have either love or insecurity. In fact, as he's dying, he will cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's he saying? I don't feel loved. One of the thieves next to him will look at Jesus and say, What are you doing? Save yourself and us. Get us off this cross. What's the thief saying? He's saying, Take care of yourself. No one else is going to take care of you. What happened? 
How does this man of incredible integrity, rooted in his idea that God loves him, the real him, and God will take care of him, how does he end up on a cross? And how does he end up saying, God, where are you? And being told to take care of himself. Well, Jesus told us that he actually came to live and to die for us. That his life of integrity was lived for us. So that when he went to the cross, he could actually shed his own integrity and take on our lies. And not just our lies, but take on our insecurity. Take on our crippling need to take care of ourselves. Jesus enters into the existential angst that causes us to lie on the cross. Jesus picks up the sin of believing the serpent in Genesis 3 on the cross. And he dies for it. And the reason why Jesus tells us is because he loves us so much, he wanted to stand in our place. He wanted to become a liar and to die for lying, to have God pour out all of his judgment and anger on our lies so that when he rose from the dead, he could tell us there's no anger left. God has given me your lies, and if you ask, God will give you my integrity. See, Jesus came, friends, so that we would know two things. We are really loved, and we can be really taken care of. Friends, God came to sin. God came in Jesus so that he could die for you, the real you, not the false version of you, not the false version of me, not not the version with the telescope, but the real me and the real you. God sees us and sees us as so lovable, he would give his life for us, the real us. But if that's true, then what would he not do to take care of us? You see, Jesus came not to just tell us not to lie, Jesus came to solve the deep and abiding questions of our heart that cause us to lie. You see, God's answer to the serpent in Genesis 3, who says, God doesn't love you. God doesn't want to take care of you. You have to get all the way to the Gospels before God looks at the serpent and Eve and all of us and says, here's how you're going to know I love you. And here's how you're going to know I'll take care of you. If you're watching this, and you're not a Christian, I cannot think of a better thing for you to hear. In this time of uncertainty, in this time of fear and anxiety, in this time of feeling like you have to take care of yourself because no one else is going to and no one really loves you, Jesus stands and says, I love you, the real you, enough to die for you, and I will take care of you. Friends, The truth of the gospel of Jesus is not just that you can become a truth teller, but it is that you can have these deep questions of your heart answered. And when those questions are answered, what will be the result? Brothers and sisters in Christ, listen, when you and I lie, we don't have an integrity problem. We have a gospel problem. We are really known and really loved. We don't have to lie to be loved. God has already done the most amazing thing to love us when we were at our worst. God loved us with his best. And if that's true, what then will he not do to take care of us? What then will he not give us? What then will he not provide for us? God loves you and God will take care of you. You don't have to cut corners. You don't have to to cheat the system. And so if you find yourself compelled to lie, if you find yourself living in a lack of integrity, the answer is to run back to the gospel, to remember what God has said about you, to remember what God has promised to do for you, to be free, not just of lying, but of the need to lie. But of course, there's a community aspect to that too, isn't there? If God has said we're lovable, the real us, then we ought to be a kind of community that would say, be the real you to me, and I will be the real me to you. And together, we will remind each other, not only that God loves us, but that we love each other. We are lovable. In your small groups, in your ABFs, in your homes, in your families, invite each other to tell the truth, to be the real you. Commit right now to letting people, 
love the real you and to loving the real people who are around you. And of course, in this time of need, let us be the instrument of God's provision for those around us. Let's tell people, you don't have to lie. You don't have to cheat the system. You don't have to cut a corner. I will take care of you. God through me will take care of you. God loves you enough to provide. You see, when we as Christians live lives of integrity, we're not saying, look at us. We are the truth. No, we're not. Jesus is. What we're saying is we no longer feel the need to lie because there's only two reasons to lie. You want to be loved and you want to be taken care of. And we don't find those things in lying. We find them in Jesus Christ, living and dying and rising from the dead. God bless you.